I just turned 50 and I think it's a good age to do things people think you're, uh, you're too old to do. Oh, there's a bite. Hey, it's Greg here with Outdoors on the Cheap, and I'm out here in the middle of nowhere next to a nice quiet lake with no other people. I got a canoe stashed out here, and we're going to put in the water and see if we can wrestle up some trout. So, uh, whew, two ducks just flew right overhead. <laughs> so, uh, stay tuned and let's, uh, let's get her in the water. This isn't a particularly big lake. <clears throat> uh, might be a kilometer across at the most. It's part of a system of lakes and rivers, basically. Uh, none of the rivers are really navigable by canoe. You have to portage. Uh, most of the rivers are short, but some of them aren't. And I mean, I'm calling them rivers, but they're basically like uh, minor creeks with the odd pool. All right, here I am at the uh, the other end of the lake. Uh, this is where the there's a really small sort of creek that runs out of the lake here into another lake, into another lake, into another lake. Uh, the water, um, the depth of the water in this system is maintained by beavers, and you can see at the end there. I can't get that close to it, but there's a beaver dam. And in different years, the water's been different levels here. So where the canoe is floating right now, in other years, I've been able to walk here and you, it was unnavigable because the water was so low. And I found over the years, I've been fishing this lake for over 10 years, that the water level in any given year can vary up to four feet, um, which is, you know, is substantial, I guess. And I don't know why the beavers do what they do or why they make those decisions. What, what I do know is that I've, you know, they always say you should cast to a beaver dam. I've never hooked a trout. See, we're getting a bit closer to the beaver dam now, right? I, I've never hooked into a trout <laughs> right next to the beaver dam. Actually, it looks like they built a secondary dam below this one. Let me see if I can get a bit closer. It's a bit dicey here getting through all these rocks. I think this is the area where I'm going to set up my minnow trap. It just looks, looks not bad. Not quite in this far but yeah wow look at that he put a second dam maybe they put a second dam in because the first dam wasn't holding the water where they wanted it perhaps okay. i mean this dam here is so substantial you could you could walk on it you can see further along there there's a second dam and the water in this system seems um remarkably high higher than normal though i can hear if I listen carefully, I can hear running water. I would say the water level below that, that dam is holding it up another two, three feet, uh, as is this one. You can just see how it drops, going down like locks, right? I'm sure humans got the idea for locks from beavers, because that is literally a beaver-made lock over there. And that second dam wasn't there, uh, I don't know, last year, I don't remember it being there. Right, I fish this lake a few times every year. Uh, I prefer to fish rivers, and I've caught trout in that river as well, um, but it's a difficult river to fish. There's so much brush, and it's hard to get near the edge and stuff like that. Uh, the lake that's below it is good. I've caught fish in that. Um, anyway, we'll see what we get today. I didn't bring any food with me here. I'm only out for a few hours, and I'm, I'm still recovering from uh, having COVID-19. Uh, so, oh, I don't really know how much I got in the tank for this sort of thing. It really... Took, uh, took the wind out of my sails. Um, it wasn't that bad, but you know, it was only about two days where I felt really lousy. Um, but uh, maybe three, I guess. Um, but I've been really low energy ever since. Now there's something about the simplicity of being out in a canoe. It's so basic. It's so, you know, low maintenance, easy to work. Uh, I see a lot of content 
on YouTube right now with people kayaking. And I mean, that's, that's fine, that's all great. But when you look at what they're doing, the gearification, the gear, I just can't get over the gear, right? The kayak has all this stuff rigged up on it. It almost looks tactical in a sense. They might have like five, six fishing rods attached to it. Uh, just, just an incredible amount of gear, incredible amount of expense. I bought this canoe for 200 bucks on Kijiji from a guy. Um, there was nothing wrong with it, nothing. I mean, it literally just stuck it in the water and used it. I bought it cheap. Uh, you know, it had been painting. It didn't look very uh, appealing. The guy, it's like someone had tried to camouflage, uh, do a camo paint job on it, and they did a lousy job. But uh, I don't care. I dragged it out in the woods in the winter and hid it under a big tree where I'd be out of the sun. Uh, have it up on, you know, sort of up off the ground so the air can get underneath it. And it's been out there for 10 years, and it's fine. It's totally fine. <laughs> Works great, right? The seats are still good. Everything's still good. Just a great canoe. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I think so much of the content out there is not about fishing and being out. I mean, this is why I started this channel, and I, I don't mean to go on a rant here, but so much of the content out there, it's not about the fishing or about the outdoors. It's about the gear and trying to sell you it. You know, you basically, you see a guy out there fishing, he's got, you know, all this gear on, uh, you know, an incredible amount of equipment on his body. He's got some sort of, you know, $200 sunglasses that are polarized. He's got, uh, you know, uh, brand names written all over his clothing, like a race car driver. And, uh, and an, inc you know, an expensive boat with an, a lot of gear in the boat. And uh, the point of that is not to, you know, instill in you a love of the outdoors or teach you anything about fishing uh, the point of that is for you to see that guy with all that gear or that gal catching fish and for you to think you need that gear to catch fish that you need that gear to properly enjoy the outdoors and that is just ridiculous and i know my viewers um you know don't fall into that uh, trap <laughs> i certainly don't I thought I'd show you this little piece of gear I keep out here with this canoe. Uh, this is, if you've ever read George W. Sears' uh, Woodcraft Camping, it's a book written by like a 19th century fishing guide, fishing and hunting guide. Um, well, always worth a read. It's not a, not a long book. And you're basically, you know, it's writings done by a guy who spent his life in the woods uh, fishing and hunting. And he's writing it as an old man sort of looking back and trying to impart all of his knowledge on the next generation. One of the recommendations he makes is to keep one of these little, I think he called it a ditty paddle. Anyway, I don't remember what he called it, but basically a short paddle, right, in your canoe as a spare, right? So let's say if you drop the big one, you can use this to get to the big one, right? This, this You can paddle with this, it's just not great. But mainly the reason is that when you're fishing, yeah, you often you got your rod in one hand and you have to maneuver the canoe a little bit just to get where you want to get point in the right direction whatever and you want a paddle that you can use with one hand right almost like a spatula right <laughs> so that's what this is that's the idea you've got a one-handed paddle that you use while you're fishing it's backup also use while you're fishing i guess um, you know it can also be used to club fish <laughs> right so it's a good little thing to have just kicking around and it's a great thing to practice you know if you want to learn how to paddle um, or sorry learn how to carve a paddle uh, this is probably one of the first paddle I ever carved in my life um, and uh, it doesn't have to be pretty it doesn't have to be great right it's also a kind of uh, when my kids were little uh, my son used to use this paddle as his paddle right when he was really little like five right um, so it's a great little way to sort of practice your carving practice your skills learn the ins and outs of doing this sort of thing and of course you've got it for your fish. Well, I've been fishing the better part of half an hour. I haven't hooked into anything. I haven't seen any rises, haven't seen any activity, haven't seen nothing. So uh, I'm actually inclined to go a bit deeper into the woods here and uh, portage to the next lake. Cause uh, I know a spot on the next lake that is pretty reliable. At least it has been for me. Got to do a bit of work to get to it, but uh, that's worth it if you catch something. And I think I can get there, um, I don't know, maybe half an hour or so, a little bit of work. Uh, so let me just, let me just explore that option. I'm going to check the minnow trap first. If we get some minnows, maybe I don't give up on this lake quite yet. This lake's always been a, a 
bit uh, difficult. I came here with a buddy uh, two years ago, and we're actually standing on the beach right there. And we must have each done a couple hundred casts each. We hadn't had a bite, hadn't had anything. And then I caught like a 16 inch, two pound trout. Um, but that was the only thing we caught that day. And I've had a lot of days like that out here where you fish and you fish and you fish and you catch a couple of fish and then it's over. <laughs> so, <laughs> not sure what that's all about. Uh, maybe there's, you know, there's just one lure. There's one thing that works great here. If you don't have that, you're, you got nothing. And there's a lot of lakes like that in Nova Scotia. That's why I prefer rivers. Um, but anyway, uh, let me look into uh, what's required to get to that next spot. Take this trap in. Get that squared away. Under the knot. That's why you do an overhand knot, so you can just pull it. <laughs> Simple knot. Really, the knot's not holding the trap to the to the shore. It's just showing you where the rope is. <laughs> I wonder if I can just get this thing right over that. I mean, I can I can portage up over land up there. And do that. But my, the river looks. I mean, I wonder if they've put a series of dams in it, and they've made the river. I mean, this was basically a creek normally, but maybe they've made it more substantial um, such that you can get a canoe down it. I find that hard to believe because beavers don't really care about canoes. <laughs> Last thing on their mind. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, boy, if I can make that happen, it'd be great. Boy, it definitely looks like there is some water in there. So I'm going to try. I'm gonna try this. Let's see what I can see what we can make happen here. Got a nice spot where I can get out here, hopefully without tipping the canoe. Always get out of the canoe with your paddle in hand, right? Doubles as a walking stick. Now I don't know how. Huh. Yeah, we'll see. How solid is this? Not too bad. Not too bad at all. all right, can I get down that? How doable is this? <laughs> so it's about a quarter click down there where it opens back up and it's, you know, very navigable. Uh, so if you can get to that. Uh, normally I had to take the canoe up through the woods and around. And I'll probably find out the hard way today that that's still the case. It's been a couple of years since I've done this. Uh, but I just turned 50 and I think it's a good age to do things people think you're, uh, you're too old to do. <laughs> right? Rage, rage in the dying of the light as the, as the poem goes. Yeah. Let's see if I can get in here without killing myself. Let's see here. There we go. That seems doable. There we go. All right. To get in without falling in. That is. That's the goal. I think we can do it. I think we got our bow. There we go. All right. Yeah. I'm just gonna sit high here, kneel on the seat for now, because I'm gonna be in and out of the canoe as I work my way down here. I'm a little bit tippy, but it's okay. Now I can see there's hardly any water down there. Darn it. Yeah. Boy, you know, a lot of movies and TV shows, you see people just walking along the river with the canoe over their head, right? That sort of thing. But in terrain like this, that doesn't always make sense. And, you know, you have to uh, work with what you've got. Now, I'm looking at the water here and there's just rocks everywhere. It's gonna scrape up the canoe. This is a fiberglass canoe. It can take a bit of a beating, but why, why do things when I don't have to, right? So for me, it makes more sense. Just, walk along the bank here with the canoe on the grass running, running along the grass 
All right here I got a spot where I can get back in. All right, it's shallow enough that I can stand to get back in the canoe. Hopefully I can paddle it down this next little stretch. Looks like I can get through. Well, you know, it does appear as though the beavers have made a system of locks through here. So this is the third dam in this system. Uh, it's making it relatively, I mean, I'm filming this, so things are more tedious than normal, but pretty easy to get a canoe through all of this. I mean, you got to get out and get back in and that sort of thing, but uh, uh, not bad. I haven't hooked in any fish along here. Uh, looks like there might be fish in this spot, but I'm not getting anything. I never have before either at the various various years. I just don't think there's enough water here. This spot here it doesn't make any sense to get, to get back in. I'm gonna put her in the water. I'm gonna just aim it down there and I'm gonna catch it down there. <laughs> it can't go anywhere beyond that. And it's so shallow here that if it does get fetched up somewhere, which it won't. Uh, I can I can grab it with my paddle or whatever. All right, so the idea is to just pointer, yeah, and go. And I'll just do this this way. <laughs> just easier than getting back into it. All right, you can see the the terrain on the shore is less than ideal for portaging. You see that? Here, we're losing her here. I don't know why it's going backwards. There we go. This is why you gotta have rubber boots when you're doing this sort of thing. Also, to some extent, the, you know, if you're going through stuff, if the boots are higher than the grass, you are tick-proofing yourself to some extent. I don't find ticks to be too big of a problem. There's a frog, it's a good sign. The amphibians are active, the fish are active usually, but uh, yeah, I don't find this area to be too ticky, but that doesn't mean anything. There's plenty of places that I, I said that about for years that are now full of ticks. Uh, one of my favorite places to fish was tick free in about 2007, and uh, oh, I don't know, somewhere around 20... Oh, I'd say 2017, 20, 2016, it became ticky as hell. Holy smokes, this is, this is becoming totally not fun. Totally not fun. Just lousy portaging terrain all around, full stop. Not dealing you any breaks. This is what I was talking about with the, the way the rivers work here. You got a lake and a lake, and you got a river that's almost nothing. You know, just barely a river, <laughs> right? A creek. Uh, and it's just rare that you actually see an actual river. And I am now regretting trying to, thinking that somehow the world had changed and I could get the canoe down doesn't look like that's going to be the case. Uh, looks like the easier going, this just looks impassable. Easier going is on this side where all this, you know, ticky looking grass is. Uh, so I got to go through that. No way around it. Anyway, here we are at the next place where you can canoe. You can see it just becomes nothing there, right? This is why I'm a big fan of canoes as opposed to kayaks. You couldn't kayak that. Basically no vessel can make it through that. I find it just easier to get in and out of the canoe in terrain like this. You know, a lot of these guys they have kayaks and they got all these fishing rods sticking up and all over the place. Everything's got to be tight down and inside the canoe. When you're dragging it, basically, you got a portage. You're dragging it through stuff like this. Everything has to be down inside the canoe. Otherwise, it's just going to end up in the bushes. Right? And the canoe just floats over brush like this. It basically floats on it. Right? It's almost made for going, it goes through the brush, the waist-high brush, almost as well as it goes through the water. Right? And you'll see it. Right? Just a piece of cake. Right? And then we're going to get back in this. 
and uh, take you to the next lake. Well, now we're coming up to the next lake. Went down that nice long still water. It's just sort of a windy, meandering still water. See a duck over there. A lot of ducks around. Relatively quiet place here, but I'm sure the wind will pick up in a minute. There's a spot I want to go to right over there, opposite side, uh, where here if the water comes in or goes out. I think it goes out there. I can't remember. Uh, anyway, it's uh, always been a good spot for trout. And uh, a little work to get to it, but uh, worth it if you can hook into something. All right, so I'm going to hit some wind here in a second. I'll shut the camera off and power through. All right, we're into the wind. This is a bigger lake connected to the initial one I was on. Sorry for the wind. All right. I'm sort of going, I don't know, maybe 45 degrees to the wind, almost side on actually. A little bit of wave, but not that big a deal. I kind of like it like this, to tell you the truth. You don't have to do anything fancy with your paddle, and you don't need a J stroke, you don't need to switch sides. Because uh, you know, the wind's trying to push the nose of the canoe that way. So I can just paddle. I, mean, I can only paddle on one side. <laughs> and I gotta paddle really hard. But boy, you make good time. <laughs> you make really good time. And these canoes, this is this brand of canoe, it's called the Great Canadian. I doubt they make them anymore. They're just fiberglass canoes they made in the 80s, I think. Uh, they're not super light. They're not super tough. But they made a lot of them. You can buy and use pretty cheap. And they are unbelievably stable in the water. Really, I mean, I'm going side on to waves here in heavy wind. I'm not the slightest bit concerned. I mean, if I'm concerned, I'm, I'm, still, I'm on the floor, right? I'm on my knees. I'm losing my battle with the wind here. As I'm getting tired. <laughs> I gotta turn this thing around, so I'm getting getting blown ashore. <laughs> See if I can get her turned around. Come on. There we go. I just need a little bit more elbow grease. I should have tacked. Well, wow, we're straight into it now. Holy smokes. I gotta kill the camera. I doubt there's a I don't you can hear a word I'm saying here. All right, here I am at the other side. You can tell the wind has died down considerably. I mean, you can tell it's windy because there's two windmills over there, right? I know it's a windy spot. These lakes always tend to be windy. They're hard to fish. Um, but there's some little spots where the fish usually are. This is a river where I think the water runs out of the lake into another lake. This is the only outlet the lake has. All that, I believe, is just sort of, there's water running in, but it's hill over there. There might be a sort of swampy area where it drains out, but there's no river going out down there. But I have caught fish in this little bit here, at the mouth of the river. So I'm gonna kind of gear up. Yeah, so at this stage of the, the journey, it makes sense to abandon the canoe. Uh, there's the lake back there. There's a little pool here. You really don't need a canoe to fish it, and it would just be a hassle to portage over this anyway. You fish it from the left-hand side. Oh, there's a bite. Definitely a bite. No dice. All right, let's try again. Oh, right into the damn tree. Ah, of course, into the tree. And the bait's gone. All right, so I had one bite and I just saw one rise. And I'm inclined to think that this spinner is just not what they want. They're rising. And uh, I think he wanted the worm. So the option is to switch to a fly or to put a hook and bobber type thing, or maybe even the best of both worlds. So I'm gonna go back to the tackle blocks and uh, rig something up and see what kind of luck I can have with that. I've been working this bobber here for about 10 or 15 minutes, 
just bobber and a worm. Worm's about, I don't know, 12 inches away from the bobber because it's not that deep here. And there's the odd, and I'm not seeing a lot of, uh, you know, mayfly action, you know, flies coming up out of the water, but I am seeing the odd rise, the trout are jumping for something. So I'm inclined to think there are some, some, you know, to some extent, there's a bit of a hatch going on here. There's flies uh, basically coming up to the surface. You know, a lot of different kinds of flies live in the water as insects and then they, uh, as aquatic insects, and then they, at some point when the water's warm enough, they, their, their back opens up and the wings come out and they're vulnerable for a few minutes before they can fly up out of the water. And the trout attack them uh, viciously <laughs> when that's the case. Um, anyway, that's been going on around here. And they don't seem to have any interest in my worm. Uh, they tried the spinner. I did get a solid hit off the spinner. I'm guessing they must have mistaken it for a, a minnow. Um, but uh, I couldn't get any more hits on it. <laughs> Which means they're not that interested in it, right? Uh, so uh, my other option here is to, I've got flies. I just didn't bring my fly rod. Um, but if you have a spinning rod like this and a bobber, um, you can just put a fly in the end. And uh, especially if it's a, <clears throat> like a nymph or a, like a hare's ear nymph, for instance. So basically a fly that can either be on the surface or in the water uh, that mimics a lot of different fly patterns. Um, it's, uh, sometimes you can get a trout to go to that. So I got to re-gear and man, the flies are really bad. I mean, it's, you can't see in the camera because they're all around my head. Um, but they're, uh, I've got a rag wrapped around my ears a handkerchief wrapped around my ears and on my neck and I got a lot of bug dope on but still they're the flies are pretty bad anyway I'm gonna try one more setup here to see if I can uh, entice these fish they don't seem to want the bait so they seem to be after flies and uh, sometimes when that's the case they just will not touch a hook so let me try that let's see what I can do here all right so here's what I'm going with here I got bobber this is really light gear I got a tiny little Gold rib hair's ear nymph, which is basically, you know, what a lot of different mayflies look like before they emerge. And it's a good all around, all around thing to have in your kit, right? And it doesn't have to be work with a fly rod. Uh, basically, if they're hitting, if they're jumping, if you're lucky, <laughs> this is a good one to have. And I wish this bobber weighed a little bit more. But I think I can get it out far enough because they're not jumping far from shore. The few I've seen jump haven't been any further away than that. I'd cast right there. So just a question of waiting. See what happens. We're there with our ducklings. I just saw a fish rise about six feet from where that duck is. <laughs> I don't want to cast over there and have the ducks go after my uh, my thing, which looks like a little bug, you never know what they're going to do, right? Boy, the flies are bad today. I wonder what the ducks do about flies. Okay, let's see if I can get it over there. A little better. There's a rise there. Always cast arises. Right over there. Let's see if I can get to it. Now I'm wishing I had my fly rod. <laughs> of course. There goes Mother Duck. Five chicks. The lake I paddled through, I was on it once, and I saw a, a mother duck like that with some baby ducks. And there was a seagull basically dive bombing the mother duck, trying to separate the mother duck from the, from the baby ducks. Uh, baby, geez, there's one right there. <laughs> baby duck that size, a uh, seagull, really young baby duck, a seagull can swallow it whole. Um, anyway, seagull's bigger and tougher and, you know, much bigger than a duck. But the duck was utterly fearless in protecting its young. I watched the whole thing go on for 10 minutes. I, I, I paddled towards it, 
but you know I doubt that did anything <laughs> boy if I could get that trout one of those trout to go after that here's your nymph they're rising my goodness there's another rise over there again there's action that's pretty close I don't know if the bobber's spooking them really don't know or if it's what they want you just never know. I've never found one particular fly to be better than another on this lake. Uh, I've caught them on Royal Coachman, I've fought, caught them on uh, Nova Scotia Mayfly, and I've caught them on a Hazer Nymph. Uh, I think I've also caught them on Dark Montreal. And of course I caught them on a Panther Martin Spinner. Actually, I don't know that I've ever caught anything with just a hook and bobber here, <laughs> strangely enough. Which, which is usually a pretty reliable uh, presentation, pretty reliable way to get fish to come around. Can't get anything after this nymph. And they're really jumping. That one over there is just going to town. Oh, there we go. Oh, it's so small. <laughs> Definitely not a keeper. Well, we got one trout there, but not a keeper <laughs> to let him go. It's just too small, him or her. Too small to keep. That's like uh, six inches or so. But yeah, the hair's ear nymph worked with the bobber. You can fly fish without a fly rod, <laughs> right? I think there's a bigger one jumping over there. So I'll get this guy off and uh, try that other spot. Come on, man, calm down. Oh! <laughs> I had him and I lost him. <laughs> I set the hook too hard. It wasn't that big anyway. It wasn't as big as I thought. Let me try again. Will he hit it again? They did hit it. I don't know if you saw that or not. Well, I've had a fish. I hadn't, hadn't lost a fish. Caught a fish and let it go. Had another bite off camera. Uh, didn't set the hook. But it was a small one anyway, basically. So uh, I think it's, and I'm at this point um, where I didn't bring a lunch today. I just brought a bottle of water with me, which is what I do a lot. I think when you're hungry, you fish better because <laughs> you're kind of, <laughs> and there's arguments that you're, you're more sort of dialed up uh, predator-wise when you're hungry. <laughs> you're supposed to notice things you know, wouldn't otherwise notice when you're hungry. Um, uh, right now I'm noticing that I'm hungry and I'm starting to fantasize about eating food. Uh, my stomach's really growling. So I'm going to do a few more casts and I'm going to, I got to go back across the lake and a portage and across another lake. Hike up. Whoa. Oh, geez. I had it. I had a fish there and I lost him. Oh no. I was talking, was not focusing. Let me clean that, clean that off. I had one there. I don't know if you can see that, but the the the, um, the bobber started moving backwards. This is a good spot. There's fish here, but uh, boy, the flies are bad, and man, am I ever hungry! This is the river that leads back to Lake Number One. <clears throat> I thought I'd just troll, so I've got that bobber and that hare's ear nymph just behind the canoe. I'm just moving along slowly here with the wind. Uh, I have caught trout in this area here on a fly in the past, but again, never in crazy quantity. Like for me, places I like to fish a lot, you can go and catch your limit. And I've never caught my limit in this system. Um, but it's pretty, it's pristine. There's no people back here. I mean, it's got all the to me, it's got all the indications of a dynamite spot for trout, but I've never had a banner day out here catching trout. I've always caught, you know, I've caught big trout. Uh, I don't think I've ever caught uh, those two trout I caught earlier this morning, uh, earlier today. Uh, those are the smallest trout I've ever caught here. Normally they're of size. They're like close to 12 inches and they're fat, but they're few and far between. Uh, so it's just a bizarre system that. You know, it probably has some secret that I just don't get. <laughs> My best guess. Uh, but I love being back here anyway. I mean, it doesn't matter as long as you're enjoying yourself, right? Uh, you know. 
Life can't be completely about utility. I mean, I put a lot of energy into my garden because, you know, I like being out in the garden, but, you know, it, it produces food. I wouldn't be doing it if it didn't result in a substantial yield. Um, but when it comes to trout fishing anyway, uh, you know, you're kind of out doing it because you like it. Uh, there's certain kinds of fishing, like when I go dip netting for smelts, uh, I don't particularly, I'm not, you know, it's not the most amazing thing in the world, but, you know, if you time it right, you're out there for about 15, 20 minutes and you, you got enough fish to feed your entire family and everybody's stuffed because you can, you can net. Did you get a bite there? No. Um, well, it's worthwhile, right? Um, but out here, you're, for me anyway, you're out for the enjoyment of it, for the, the serenity. I mean, it's so quiet back here. Right, there's almost just nothing, right? Just dead quiet. If I stop paddling, just in the middle of nowhere, you know. Does it get any better than that? <laughs> the only thing that would be better is if uh, drag started singing on my reel. Uh, that would be better. <laughs> but uh, that's okay. It's a nice uh, big beaver lodge over there. Look at the size of it. Substantial beaver lodge. Well, that's one beaver, right? That beaver just lives here. Uh, I doubt that beaver is working on the dams above this, right? The beaver works on the dam below its lodge because it wants to control the outflow of the water, at least as far as I understand beaver behavior. And the great thing about trolling with a fly on a bobber, <laughs> so you don't have to worry about hook and bottom, at least. It's probably not as effective, right, because the bobber, a lot of people would argue, spooks the fish. Uh, as long as you're not going too fast and it isn't, you know, it, it, you know, a couple feet from the fly, I mean, you saw earlier I was getting hits on the fly, right? So, you know, they're not that fussy. I mean, I don't think this is a high pressure area. <laughs> just no signs of people here. It's just, it's just wilderness. It's just absolute beautiful wilderness, which is what I like. I like being in places like this. The only drawback of places like this is that you're, uh, <laughs> I'm really, really, really hungry. And I am at least an hour from getting out of the woods, maybe more. I'm so hungry <laughs> and I'm down to like my last cup of water sort of thing, right? Just brought a, just brought a, um, not even a liter, uh, like a quart of water with me. Uh, just, that's the way I always, I always go light into the woods. Uh, never bring a lot of gear. I always try, I mean, I only brought a fanny pack with me. I didn't even bring a backpack. Um, and I got the basics, the means to make fire, compass, knife, you know, backup knife, all that sort of stuff. But, uh, yeah, you cannot, in a day, you can't dehydrate, you can't starve to death, <laughs> right? And I'd planned to basically go in in the morning and come out around lunch. That was the plan for today. That's basically the time I had. So despite going pretty far back into the woods, uh, that was what I was going to do. So now I'm, oh darn, grab something there. Anyway, we're getting into portage territory. I better pack up the rod and put it away. Just thought I'd give you a little footage of this portage and what I'm up against. <laughs> kind of terrain we got here. Definitely not. Definitely a younger man's game. <laughs> I don't know if I'm. I don't know what category I fall into anymore. I just turned 50. Not a young man. Maybe not an old man. Somewhere in between. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Holy smokes. This is what I was trying to avoid. In here with the black flies dragging a canoe. Oh, here you just take your time. Pick your spots.
Anyway, the idea of picking this thing up over your head and walking through terrain like this is just ridiculous. <laughs> For those, <laughs> there's just too many things you gotta duck underneath and it's too treacherous. I mean, for me, going along, I got the canoe in the sand and I got the paddle and I'm using that like a walking stick because it's just, you just look at the, it's just so easy to twist an ankle for something to go wrong, right? Um, and you gotta negotiate terrain like this. So for my money, it just makes more sense. You're not damaging the canoe by dragging it over stuff like this. You know, and most of the weight is being borne by the ground instead of your your body. So it's it's less tiresome to move a canoe this way. Right? Eventually you get get into something like this, you can really move quick with it. Ah, oh. I think we're pretty much I don't know if we're at dam one or dam two yet. Uh, I think I've made my point. <laughs> I'll kill the camera. I'll see you in the next bit. Here we are back at dam number one. No fish. Big paddle ahead of me. Big hike. <laughs> that's fine. That's that's where I set my expectations today anyway. <laughs> so uh this place, the system gets better as the season rolls on. It's never good in mid-May, early May, April, for me anyway. Maybe there's a trick to it, but for me, uh, I find it's better in June when things are warmed up. Uh, there's lots of places that are great this time of year, but I think it's windy and cold up here, and this system's always a little bit behind, but it was such a nice day. And uh, I wanted to get back here and see everything. It's been a while since I've been out this way. Come on now. There we go. Piece of cake. Well, that's it. Just a uh, morning out in the woods, uh, enjoying the nature, uh, just peace and the quiet, the tranquility. It would have been nice if I'd uh, caught some keepers, but uh, wasn't to be. Uh, had a few fish on, caught a couple, but. Uh, Nothing worth keeping and just uh, not happening for me today. Uh, maybe in a couple weeks uh, the system will get a bit more active and we'll see. Uh, or I'll go to another spot <laughs> that's got more fish. <laughs> no. This is a neat system here. This is all trout. There's all, basically trout and minnows. There's no perch, there's no bass, there's no pickerel. There's nothing like that here. It's just trout. There's very few systems like that left in Nova Scotia. And I mean, I guess. What happens is a lot of people come to a place like this and they don't catch anything and instead of just thinking well I need to be a better angler they say how about I throw a bucket of bass in there how about I throw a bucket of chain pickerel in there and then I, then anyone can catch anything in there right because it's basically easier fish to catch in general um, but uh, it's nice that there's a few I mean this is just just absolutely I mean, you can see uh, I don't know if you can tell in the distance there's wind off in the distance there but other than that, <laughs> it's pristine. <laughs> there's no houses, there's no cottages, there's no nothing out here, right? Uh, just, just beautiful, pristine wilderness <clears throat> with windmills. <laughs> anyway, I hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please like, share, subscribe, and until next time, enjoy the outdoors on the cheap. Thanks for watching.